Hey everyone, hope you're doing well. This is The Deep Dive. My name is Drew Creeper. I'm the Director of Advisory Services here at Creeper Wealth. And I'm joined as always by John, with John Creeper, our founder and senior wealth advisor. And John, today we're gonna to be talking about a lot of stuff going on in the world, in the world of economics, in the world of US government debt, and in markets in general. Um, so we'll get into that in a minute, but before we do, how you doing? Hey, doing great. Um, I'll tell you what, it's been interesting here in central Illinois. Um, you know, two weeks ago, we were like at 73 degrees and it dropped down and got cold. And I was at home a couple nights ago and I was watching uh, one of my favorite shows on TV. And I opened up the windows um, in our living room. And like 30 minutes later, I looked at the ceiling and it was full of these little bitty bugs. And it's like, what in the world? Uh, we're still in winter time, right? It's still the end of February, 1st of March. It's like, where'd the bugs come from? And, um, and so I made my concoction with some apple cider vinegar and I put uh, two drops of, uh, of dish soap in there and I put some plastic on the top and punched little holes in. I set it out. And the next morning, all the bugs were dead. And, um, and so there's a, you know, an old wise uh, tale to actually use as far as you were to bugs. But then all of a sudden, then it got cold and we're close to freezing last night. And I thought, you know, we had this changing of the seasons and uh, it caused all the bugs to wake up from their hibernation. Um, and then all of a sudden they got cold again. And um, and then the bugs will get, you know, they'll be healed off as far as with the frost when it hits through. And I just thought, you know, it's kind of like the stock market. Um, it's got seasons. It has times when it gets uh, um, hot for some reason for a short period of time, overly hot, kind of like what the spring was here in, in central Illinois or the winter was in central Illinois. But then all of a sudden it gets cold again. And whenever you see those things flopping and floating around, it's time to make some changes uh, to try to redeem the time and make money while you can. Yeah. For sure, for sure. And John, you know, a big reason why the market got hot towards the end of last year through the first few months of this year was because there was an expectation that the Federal Reserve was going to significantly cut their target interest rate, uh, essentially saying, hey, we've conquered inflation. Uh, that's what cutting interest rates means. Uh, we want to make sure we support the economy and don't push us into a deep recession. Uh, so that is why uh, they're considering cutting interest rates. And in part, when interest rates go down, uh, typically, that's a good thing for stocks. And so that's been a big driver of the last few months here in the market. Uh, but John, let's talk big picture before we get in, into the nitty market. Uh, why is cutting interest rates a big deal as it relates to the U.S. government debt? Oh, it's huge. You think about it. I mean, you kind of think about the total U.S. government debt. Um, you know, it was an interesting website, the U.S. government debt clock. And uh, you just search that thing out. We have a link here as far as in this email. Uh, whenever you look at that, it is a running clock that shows how much debt we have. We're at 34.4, pushing $34.5 trillion of debt, which is a huge amount of debt. Um, and it actually jacked up a lot the last four years with the whole COVID crisis, a lot of things surrounding that. Uh, projecting by 2034, so 10 years from now, CBO is projecting it to be over $58 trillion, which is just a huge amount of debt. Uh, right now, as related to the overall economy, the GDP of the United States, um, our debt load is 120% of the GDP. And so that means for every dollar produced in the economy, there's a dollar 20 of debt outstanding um, as far as on the U.S. government debt. That's a phenomenal thing. Also, think about this. Um, in 2020, um, the average interest paid on all of the government debt was 2.5%. Um, and now it's at 3.15 percent. So hmm. when interest rates go up by 0.65 percent, it's like, well, that's not that significant. But when we're talking having that interest being paid on 34.5 trillion dollars, that's a lot of money. And so you have to say, where is that money going to come from? Um, well, the U.S. government, they have two ways, like in your own personal life. You have some debt. You really have two ways um, that you can actually get rid of your debt. Number one is to change your prioritize, uh, priorities and decrease spending. And I don't think U.S. government's going to do that. Um, and so the second thing you can do is to raise revenue. Um, you can get a side hustle. You can start a business. You can work some more hours, um, you know, create a new business, whatever it might be. Well, you make extra money and use that to pay down the debt. Well, the way the U.S. government can actually make more money, um, you know, I don't see President Biden getting a side hustle. And uh, using that, or Mitch McConnell getting the side hustle and using those dollars to pay down the debt. Um, instead, what they do is they raise the revenue by adjusting tax rates. And so, you know, tax rates are going to have to go up um, just to be able to service the debt load. 
And so that's really kind of played into a lot of educational pieces we have coming out soon, Drew. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, John, I had this debt clock up in front of me, and there's one number that stands out. It's just kind of surprising, maybe a little bit shocking. It's in the top left-hand corner next to the U.S. national debt counter, uh, and it's debt per taxpayer. Uh, this is over $266,000 per U.S. government taxpayer, uh, which when you think about that, to your point, uh, that's a huge number, which is likely why we believe that in the next number of years, taxes will be going up for both individuals and corporations. Uh -huh. And uh, there's a, definitely a lot that we can help our clients do uh, as it relates to saving money on taxes, uh, which is why we're spending so much time talking about it. Yeah, I'll tell you what, Drew, it's stacking. Think about companies, think about risk as far as in the marketplace, the number of risk out there. Um, you know, I think one is having no plan to actually go through and uh, structure out your uh, financial steps you need to make. Uh, no plan as far as with an income plan, no plan for a tax plan. I think having no plan is just a huge risk people never really consider. Um, over 81% of retirees and pre-retirees, as measured by AARP, have no income plan uh, in retirement that lays out how, where they're getting the money from in retirement for income and what how much they're paying in taxes. Um, but we also have a, a risk from Washington. Uh, Washington risk is huge. It does not matter. Um, which side of the fence you lay on? Are you voting red? Are you voting blue? Um, I can say Washington risk across the board is high, uh, whatever that may be. Um, but also we know that market risk is high. And so when you think about it, let's kind of talk about this a little bit. We, we are going to see an adjustment as far as in corporate taxes. If corporate tax rates go up um, and they take rid of some of the deductions on the corporate level, well, then what that means is, is that companies will be making less money because they're paying more in taxes. And ultimately, why does the stock market, why does the stock go up? A given stock will go up if the perception or the belief is that that company is going to make more money in the future. So if they're paying more money in taxes, that means they're making less money for shareholders. That means the stock won't go up. So there's a lot of huge risk that surrounds the debt that's out there. Huge decision points. We have over 120 uh, different things you can do to reduce taxes legally. And, um, you know, there's five biggies that we always want to try to incorporate in there. Uh, but, Drew, that's where those, those strategies really come, in, come into play. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, John, you use the phrase income plan. I want to make sure everyone knows what that is. Uh, when you just think about an income plan, you think, oh, that's just how I pull money out of my investment accounts. But what truly is a holistic income plan that we're building for each of our clients? Yeah, so when it gets right down to it, it's, it's what is the level of income that you need in order to be able to live a lifestyle that you desire. And you wanna say, how do I structure my assets um, and where am I pulling my income from? So number one is, what are your guaranteed income sources, which is social security and pension, and how do we maximize those dollars coming out of there? What is the best selection method uh, to get you the highest level of income? Then from there, we say, well, your guaranteed income sources are X, your retirement lifestyle is Y, um, do you have excess coming from your sources or is there some type of gap? And so in other words, if your needs are more than Social Security and pension, well, then how are we going to fill that gap or satisfy your income? Well, then we have to look at all your assets to say, is there a way for us to um, generate income consistently every single month and to have it taxed at a level that it increases your take-home pay? And so when you look at that, it's even things saying, well, there's four types of buckets of investments. And so we have um, uh, tax always, uh, which would be money coming out of, uh, let's say, Social Security and pension and things like that, earned income. There's tax deferred. Well, that's money coming out of your IRA, your 401k, or even some non-qualified annuities or savings bonds. Um, and then we have tax free. And so those would be dollars coming out of, um, let's say, uh, your life insurance uh, proceeds or if you take a loan on life insurance, uh, municipal bonds are, are as far as the tax free. Uh, but then also we have uh, buckets that are capital gains. And so each of those has a different tax status. And so part of that income plan, Drew, is saying what dollars are in which tax status, and then how do we organize when they're going to come out? And so if tax rates are lower, we may recommend that you pull the money out of your IRA because that's fully taxable. But if we're projecting that tax rates are going to go up in the future, well, then we'd prefer not to pull the money from the IRA in the future, if at all possible, and instead pull it out of a non-taxable account, which could be your capital gains or your Roth IRA. Right, right. So, you know, each of our clients, they receive that holistic income plan that addresses 
your income needs, your tax plan, and your investment plan. I would encourage you, uh, if you've not revisited that, if you're a client of ours, definitely revisit that with your advisor. We see there's some huge risk in terms of taxes in the years ahead. Um, and if you're not a client of our firm, we'd be happy to work on one of those income plans for you. Now, John, let's kind of shift gears a little bit away from taxes and let's talk markets in general. Uh, we've been on a nice run here the last few months. And like I said earlier, uh, the expectation about decreasing interest rates was a big driver of that. Uh, where do we see where markets are right now? And what are the big threats that we are seeing out there? I'll tell you, what, we're seeing a lot of movement. I mean, uh, this market has really come so far so fast. Uh, and it really accelerated into the fall of last year, November, December, and the first two months of this year. Um, but we're still seeing leadership happen in a very narrow group of, of individual companies. And so, you know, if you have NVIDIA, I mean, it's still on a huge tear uh, on the upside. Um, but broad-based, we're seeing other companies start to kind of get hit on the chin a little bit. Um, Apple had a phenomenal fall, but Apple's negative year to date. Um, you know, you can look at some other growth names out there. Macro Libre um, had a phenomenal run, uh, had an earnings announcement that was excellent. Um, but forecast was not as strong. Well, then when the forecast is not as strong, uh, those individual companies have taken to the woodshed a little bit. Um, and so we're starting to see in the market, um, we're starting to see under the surface, um, a little bit more selling activity from institutions um, than we had seen previously when they were buying. And so they're providing a backstop a little bit. So right now, of the five major indices that we follow, uh, one of them is starting to show a little bit of yellow, uh, which means caution. The other four are still bullish, but under the surface, it's looking like they're starting to turn a little bit to where it's like, okay, whenever we see this turn a little bit, usually then that heads to a little bit of a pullback in the market in the 5 to 10% range. And so right now, we're looking for a singular event that would actually push it down there. And so because of that, it's causing us to go from having our foot all the way down on the gas pedal to where we have our right foot still on the accelerator, but our left foot right now is hovering over top of the brake pad, Drew. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things uh, that we talked a lot about last year was the Magnificent Seven stocks and how they were largely responsible for over 70 percent of the total return in the S&P 500. What we've seen, and you mentioned Apple, this is why I'm thinking about it. Uh, we've begun seeing a number of those generals, uh, quote unquote, to get shot. Uh, and whenever you see the general, the leaders of the market beginning to turn, that's usually a sign that we have some volatility on the horizon. Uh, right now, the only three generals out of that Magnificent Seven that are still doing very well uh, is NVIDIA, Meta, so that's Facebook, uh, and Microsoft. Those three seem to be what's holding up the market generally uh, with where we are at. And so, John, you kind of mentioned our foot's hovering over the break. What exactly does that mean? Does that mean we're going all to cash? Are we staying invested? What exactly is that? Was How does that actually play out in client accounts? Yeah, so right now, we're simply looking at, at simply some, trading some positions. And so. Um, so in other words, increasing some cash, but not going 100% to cash, right? And so we still believe there's some opportunities out there in the broad-based market, um, but we are starting to see some things of saying, let's pull a little bit of profit off the table. And guys, remember, you're never going to hit the ultimate high, and you're never going to hit the, and buy the, on the ultimate low. And so on that, we're simply looking for large macro trends. And so whenever we see that, we always start to say, let's, let's really kind of start to feather um, into positions and feather out of positions. What that means is we still love NVIDIA. We think it's a long-term play. However, we may start looking to slice a little bit off of the holdings and maybe go from a 15% down to a 13%. Um, you know, if we have something like an Apple, which is starting to accelerate a little bit more on the downside, again, we hit a um, we hit a high around 184 or so this year, um, and it's kind of dropped down about 8%, 9% off of that high. Well, that would be saying, hey, let's start maybe knocking down 25, 30% off of that just to try to make sure we're in a better position to set up so that we're not going to be trying to catch a falling knife. And so we're looking at slicing the positions. Um, also, broad base in our passive equity, uh, Drew, we're looking at decreasing uh, some of the things provided huge growth, which would be um, NASDAQ and SP 500, and um, taking some of those dollars and going into a cash position that we're getting 5.3 to 5.4%, depending upon the day. Um, and why are we doing that? It's to protect a little bit from the downside um, and also reposition for a, for a better, a stronger reentry point. Yep, absolutely. So if you're a client of our firm, you may be seeing some trades pop up and these notifications in the next week or so. Uh, what we're doing exactly what John's laying out is just 
being prudent uh, with the positions we have and trying to protect those gains that we've made uh, here in the last number of months. And so, John, overall, we covered a lot of ground here. What is the one key takeaway that you want folks to have from uh, today's video? I feel it doesn't matter whether you're kind of looking at your income plan um, or a tax plan or your investment plan for your portfolios. You want to make sure you have a logic based plan that's based upon rules. Um, and at the end of the day, when you do that, you end up having a logical position moving forward and you're not being whipsawed uh, by the craziness and the emotion that we see in the market and that we see in the media today. And so make sure you have a plan in place, for whatever your objective is. And so whether it be paying down personal debt, whether it be retirement income, whether it be taxes, whether it be portfolio management, uh, it doesn't matter what it is. Let's make sure you talk to your advisor, make sure you have a plan in place so you can move forward with confidence. Yeah, absolutely. So guys, if you have any questions, our team is standing by and ready to help however we can, whether that's on the tax front or as it relates to your investment portfolio, our advisors are ready and able to help you however we can do so. So thanks for the time, guys. Look forward to talking to you soon and we'll see you all later.